I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. To Jesse. Jesse. Today, we discuss secret government space programs. Sit tight. The show starts now. The world according to Jesse. Jesse. Hello and welcome to The World According to Jesse. I'm Brigitte Santos with the mighty governor, Jesse Ventura. Now, during the Cold War, outer space became an important theater for the United States and Soviet Union to exercise technological and scientific prowess. The space race began in 1957 when the USSR successfully launched the first artificial satellite into orbit. Shortly after, the USSR also sent the first humans into orbit. But by 1969, the United States reached a milestone of its own, putting the very first man on the moon. When the Soviet Union fell, Russia and America started cooperating in space. Governor, other than space, where else could the United States and Russia cooperate? You know, that's very interesting, Brigida. So we get along great with the Russians when it comes time to explore space. Well, why can't we transfer this to other things, too? If we can coexist with them and work with them to go into space, why can't we continue to work with them and coexist with them right down here on Earth? It makes no sense to me. Space okay? Earth no good? I'm confused. <laughs> All right, even though Russia and America sometimes work together in space, it doesn't mean that competition between the two has gone away. After all, the origins of the space race are rooted in the military. Today, 70% of the United States Army's major weapons and equipment depend on satellites in order to work. This fact was recently highlighted during the military's most recent Space Week. The United States Army Space Forces consist of over 2,200 active duty soldiers, reservists, and civilians under the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command and Army Forces Strategic Command. The Army first created the Office for Ballistic Missile Defense in 1957, but the latest exercise aims to attract more officers to the FA-40 field. Now, the FA-40 is a small cadre of military and civilian professionals who have been qualified for space-related tasks. Governor, the largest user of space-based assets in the Department of Defense is in the Army. As technology improves, do you think our military will eventually be trained for combat in space? And if so, what kind of operas operations do you think these forces will train for? You got me, Brigida, but you can bet for sure that if the military's involved, there has to be something with defense or waging war. And uh, so when we go into space, maybe that's the new battlefield. We'll be out there rather than here on Earth. And what are we going to see? Your guess is as good as mine. There's a new Star Wars film out. Maybe you should go to that. It might be a documentary. <laughs> All right, the results of a year-long war game have just been announced. The game was funded by contractors with the Department of Justice and Pentagon, and according to their findings, China and Russia have extended the reach of their long-range weapons, undermining America's access and influence in Eastern Europe and the South China Sea. Officials say that this poses a strategic problem for the U.S. High-frequency radars belonging to Russia and China mean their satellite imaging capabilities are more advanced. The radars can also reportedly hear certain submarines underwater. The bottom line, these contractors are saying that U.S. forces won't be able to avoid detection unless they also advance their own technology. Now, what I find interesting is that one participant in the war game said that when participants were faced with the advanced technologies from Russia or China, they, quote, eventually gave up threw their hands in the air and stated, either I have to escalate and start the war, or I have to sit back and do nothing. Governor, that's a really scary quote because it reflects what I think is really happening. Defense contractors are pushing for war just to get militaries around the world to fund their weapons. Why doesn't the public know about this? Because you got mainstream media <laughs> paid for by the very corporations that create the weapons. You know, why would they worry about that when they got all these other big, massive issues to deal with? You know, like whether 
like whether uh, a gay people can be put on a, a cake, you know, on a wedding cake. Now, those are big issues that we all have to deal with on a daily basis, and they're important to all of us, right? No. This is a case where why aren't we working with China? Why aren't we working with Russia? And let the, let the Earth go into space. And when I say the Earth, I mean all of the Earth. China, Russia, the United States, and whomever else is involved. We could accomplish a lot more working together than we can trying to destroy each other and, and get into a space race weapons thing up in space. We're going to have weapons going up there, what, so they can shoot back to Earth? You know, what will these weapons actually do? It's a scary thought. President Trump has announced his plans to send American astronauts back to the moon. He has signed the Space Policy Directive 1, which establishes the creation of a new mission to go back to the moon and also a separate mission to Mars. This comes in response to China's announcement that it will send an astronaut to the moon as well. So when it comes to the space race, are we better off focusing on these types of projects which advance our understanding of outer space rather than focusing on how to use weapons in space? Absolutely. We can gain so much knowledge from things we learn in outer space that we can apply back here on Earth and make living for every human being on this planet a better deal. War, I'm sick of war. I'm tired of it. And I don't want war taken into space. But I'll tell you, I don't know how we're going to avoid it because you got the hawks out there, the chicken hawks that build these weapons. They want ways to shoot them. They want to fire them all the time and go to war all the time. We, the people, have to rise up. You know, there's that old saying, suppose they gave a war and nobody showed up. I would love to see that. Oh, by the way, Brigida, now that we're on the subject, let me hold this up a moment. <laughs> What this is right here, this is an honorable discharge from the United States Navy. It's my honorable discharge from the United States Navy. Something Donald Trump, all of his money in the world, can't buy him. An honorable discharge. So who's really the patriot, Donald Trump or Jesse Ventura? All right. Let's say we do get to Mars. Uh, what do you imagine for the future of humankind? Would you go to Mars if you were given the opportunity? Well, unfortunately, Brigitte, I'm 66 years old now, and I get the suspicious feeling that by the time we get to Mars, I'm not sure, would I be like a Supreme Court justice where they could appoint me to go there for life? You know, I wouldn't have to pass a physical <laughs> or be of a certain age to do the trip. Would I go if given the opportunity? I think I would. All right. It's time to cut to a quick break. When we return, Jesse sits down with Dr. Stephen Greer to discuss secret government UFO programs and evidence of extraterrestrial beings. Stay tuned. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. <laughs> Mark Twain said it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. That could be why America is so divided now, because people have been fed fake news paid for by corporate interests. They beat you down until you believe their fairy tales. Well, here's a story for you. It's called The Big Picture, and it's full of facts, not fiction. Question one. Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant. Question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. 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 Dr. Stephen Greer is a ufologist. He is the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Disclosure Project. He joins me to discuss the findings of his latest documentary, Unacknowledged. Dr. Greer, has UFO secrecy been ruthlessly enforced by our government? And if so, why? 
Why would the government need to be so secret about it if it indeed is happening? Well, the, the, it, the secrecy has to do with the technology behind how these UFOs operate. And back when it, the secrecy first started, uh, let's say in the 40s, in that era, uh, the secrecy was because they didn't know what the heck they were dealing with, and that was understandable. By 1954, and this is a very important date, October 1954, which is a year before I was born, and I'm no spring chicken, uh, we had mastered what's called gravity control, electromagnetic gravitic systems, or so-called anti-gravity is how pop culture would say, uh, you know, would describe it. And actually up until that point in the literature, aerospace literature, there was open discussion about anti-gravity, UFOs, things of this sort, and then it went black. And the reason it went black in that era is that the financial cartels mainly did not want people to understand that we have not needed oil or gas or jet engines or these things for decades. So this is a really a technology story. It has very little to do with uh, little green or gray men out there. And, and so uh, what began in that era during the uh, late Truman and, and Eisenhower period was a structure of secrecy called unacknowledged special access projects. And I'm sure uh, that you as a military guy may have come across these or heard of them. And, I don't think so. Uh, well, the unacknowledged ones are off the books. They are not acknowledged to anyone who's not in the compartmented operation, and uh, up to and including the President of the United States. And uh, this is something we can actually prove, and it's a terrible breakdown in our constitutional oversight system. So what you're saying is that we, the, the reason they're hiding this from us is because the technology's there that we wouldn't need the fossil fuel industry? We would not, no, we do not need oil, gas, or coal, or nuclear power, or centralized utilities, and have not needed them for decades. So you're talking several hundred trillion dollars in assets that would be impacted by the disclosure of the fact that we're uh, not alone, because the very first thing any physicist is gonna ask is, how did they get here? And when they ask that, if they look at this seriously and look at this, for example, this documentary, uh, Unacknowledged is the, the number one documentary on iTunes worldwide this year and on Netflix. What you're going to find is that this has been known and studied for 70 years and that the technologies have gone through many generations of development. So the whole charade about global warming and what do we do about it and et cetera and so on, uh, the solution is there, but the problem is people don't want the solution to come out because it will terminate hundreds of trillions of dollars in oil, gas, and coal wealth and the petrodollar system that the whole world has developed around macroeconomically since Bretton Woods and after World War II. So this is, this is a huge problem. It has very little to do with the fact that there's intelligent life out there. It's a human problem of the abuse of power uh, and the secrecy that has devolved into these unacknowledged special access projects, which are really rather frightening uh, in how they operate. Talk about the historic files you've uncovered. What, what do these files reveal? Well, for example, in the movie Unacknowledged, we have an Air Force intelligence officer who, who admits that he worked this issue, an Air Force Office of Special Investigations officer out of uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, and that we had, have facilities in Nevada at the Lockheed Skunk Works and elsewhere where we have essentially reverse engineered these extraterrestrial craft uh, that we have obtained uh, and uh, studied for many decades. And the military, uh, part of it is really the lesser part of it at this point. It's more the overall intelligence community and the corporate and financial community that wants to keep this secret. Most of the high-ranking officers I've met with would love to see this disclosed properly. Uh, but I think that including generals and admirals at the Pentagon. And I think that we're in a situation right now where uh, you have the tail wagging the dog. But one of the cases that really struck me as extraordinary, that it was admitted, it's, it's actually in the book. There's a book that accompanies the documentary, and the book is the same title, Unacknowledged. And as you know, a, a, a book contains a lot more information than a documentary can. What you find in that one account from this Air Force officer is that we were test flying one of these uh, 
retrieved extraterrestrial vehicles, but we had switched out the power plant. We didn't quite know how theirs worked with something that had a nuclear component. It malfunctioned outside uh, in Houston, outside Houston, and it's called the Cash Landrum case. And it uh, irradiated all these innocent civilians on the ground as it was going down. And this Air Force officer, uh, Doty, who was the principal investigator of this cr uh, crash landing, uh, was actually the debriefer also of the pilots, and the, the human pilots of this object. And it came out of Nellis Air Force Base, what people call Area 51, although that's not the proper name for it. And this was a case where the civilians were, were critically injured uh, with spewing radiation out of this craft. And uh, it was covered up by the government. They tried to sue for it because there were military uh, uh, helicopters trying to escort this thing down that eventually did land after this core breach of the nuclear system on board. But th this is a case now where we have a, a long-standing officer in the Air Force, a career man, admitting that this happened. He was the principal case. Now take that case, and I have 850 military and intelligence and corporate people like him in my archive now. How high up do these black ops space things go with, within our government? How, how high do these projects go? Well, it's a very good question. It really depends on the person and not the structure. So I'm going to say something here that's a little shocking. It really doesn't matter if you're the president or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. It matters if you're willing to go along with the agenda of the secrecy. And here's what I mean by that. that the, uh, for, I'll give you one great example. Some years ago, I briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Wilson. So he was J2. I'm sure you're familiar with that system. And it was a, a stand-up briefing at the Pentagon. I had astronaut uh, Edgar Mitchell with me in attendance and some of our military contacts who had handled these cases all the way back to the Eisenhower years. I had given the Admiral a secret document from the National Reconnaissance Office, which runs all the secret spy satellites, um, that listed the code names and code numbers as of the early 90s uh, managing this issue. He actually recognized one of them and contacted one of those compartmented operations. When he got hold of them, he was told, sir, you do not have a need to know. And he says, god damn it, how can I not have a need to know? I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said, sir, we will not discuss this with you further, and hung up on him. So it, it, it's a very big problem. So have there been people in J2 who have been read into this or briefed on it? Yes. But this particular man, they did not want to know because they didn't think he would go along with the agenda. And the same thing is, was true of, of, of General Patrick Hughes, three-star general that I briefed who was head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Now, I sat with him in his offices. He had made specific inquiries of actionable intelligence we had given him. He was denied any information. In fact, he was just ridiculed. And he told me that people on his staff wouldn't tell him, and he asked me why. I said, well, what would you do if you found out there was an illegal criminal operation going on within our government, much bigger than, a thousand times bigger than Watergate, and that was keeping from the public the things that would make our world an incredibly you know, beautiful place without pollution and poverty within a generation. He says, well, I wouldn't stand for that. He, he said, I would uphold the Constitution. I said, yes, you would. And that's why they're not going to tell you a damn thing. So it really, it has very little to do, Governor, <clears throat> with your rank. It has more to do with whether, uh, I call it, they do a soul biopsy. <laughs> I'm a doctor, medical, I'm a trauma doctor by training. <laughs> And so I say they actually do a deep analysis of your psychology. Are you going to go along with this or not? If the answer is a chance of not, I don't care if you're the director of the CIA. I sat with R. James Woolsey, Clinton's CIA director, for almost three hours, and he and President Clinton made specific inquiries into this issue and were denied access. And now, you know, he later tried to cover up that meeting. <laughs> Because I always say, you know, in Washington, you know, how do you know the lawyers are, are lying? Their lips are moving. But um, I'm yeah. sorry to say that. But uh, I don't feel I don't I don't I don't feel so bad today when I did conspiracy theory when I'd get turned down. Jeez, yeah. I'm in pretty good company, aren't I? For people that can't get 
questions answered by the government. Exactly, exactly. And you're, you're now talking about the director of the CIA, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the head of Intelligence Joint Chiefs of Staff, all of whom I have privately briefed, not to mention members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, et cetera, and so on. So, so what you find well, with this is that it really has very little to do with your rank. It's whether you're willing to go along with the secrecy. Now, are there senators who know? Yes, Senator John Warner of Virginia was a member of the committee handling this. Would he admit the existence of these programs to fellow senators? No, he would not, not even in his own party. Now, I know this for a fact because I am friends with his son. So I think that this is a very complex story. We try to sort of touch on a little bit in the documentary and more in the book, which you can get at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, what have you. But it's, it's, it's a story really not so much about life in outer space, which most people assume there's intelligent life out there. It's how we have misfired in our civilization for the rule of law, the, the, the Constitution, and what have you, has just been swept aside by people desperate to keep this secret to protect their power. It's all about power. Yeah. Uh, just to have some fun here at the end, though, i got to ask you. So extraterrestrials have made contact with us? Yes, there have been events where they have, uh, well, we have 4,000 cases where they've landed on, on the ground. And, for, for example, the case in Bent Waters, uh, the, 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 our, the Air Force Base in, in, in England, there was a craft that landed that was basically a pyramid-shaped object, and there was contact between the uh, military, U.S. military officers there in England at RAF Bent Waters and the extraterrestrials on board. So that has happened. It's well documented. We have uh, their case histories. We have tape recordings of the officers who were there uh, talking about what happened. We have their videotapes and their, and their um, testimony. In fact, we have so much evidence that it's sort of uh, outrageous that you know, this is not the, the first thing that you see on CNN and uh, the Washington Post and New York Times, but there are two. One of the things, you, if you look at the, the movie Unacknowledged, you'll see that the media is a big part of the problem. The media has very systematically covered this up at the request, at the request of the IC, the, the intelligence community. You know, I don't get it. Couldn't they still cover up the fact that the fossil fuel industry would still exist and still let us know that there, there is people beyond our Earth, that there's an intelligent source and that we know about it? We're not capable of understanding that. I mean, these people ain't no better than me. Well, and I've been on yes. both sides of the fence. I've been a sure. governor and a mayor, and I've been a regular citizen and military. Right, right. I can handle it. Yeah, why, no. don't they, why don't they give me the benefit of the doubt? Well, because they don't, they're afraid of two things. One, the scandal of how this has been kept secret would just shock people, frankly. We don't have time to go into all the murder and mayhem that has occurred. I can tell you that there are three people on my team in the early days who were assassinated trying to get this information out through me. I will also tell you that the, uh, the fact that the, the ETs, these, these civilizations are watching to see if we want to grow up or not. They're not going to land at the Super Bowl. Um, it, they sort of had the whole prime directive <laughs> thing. You know, They're waiting to see if we you know, get half a clue uh, before something massive happens. However. Uh, if you were to acknowledge that they're here in near-Earth orbit even, let's say that they would say, oh, well, we detected an interstellar vehicle in our solar system. Well, people are going to ask, how did it get here? And that's the end of oil, because I can assure you that as soon as the mainstream media and, and science community ask that question, they are going to, if they start digging into this, they're going to find out how those things operate, because this is virtually an open secret. It just is unacknowledged. You know, I got to tell you, Doctor, one of my favorite films of all time is mm. the original The Day the Earth Stood Still yep. with Gort. Yeah, I agree. It's awesome. And I mean, I watched that film, and what you talked to me today about tells me that that wasn't so far fetched after all, was it? Exactly. And in fact, the way that uh, we responded to their presence, I have been told that there are people in our State Department who assisted in the making of that film as a counterpoint to the uh, dysfunction that was going on inside the uh, military-industrial complex. And this is why Eisenhower said, beware the military-industrial complex. And Eisenhower was a five-star general. So uh, I think that film actually was made in response to that. 
Well, Dr. Greer, thank you. I'd love to have you back on. I could listen to you all day tell a story. So Great. thank you, and thank you for coming on RT. Thank you. We're having difficulty getting guests now, and I appreciate it that you come on. Oh, I, I'll speak to anyone who has an open mind to listen. Thank you for your work. Appreciate it. The world according to Jesse. All right, it's time to turn to our fans. We asked people on Twitter, do you think the Pentagon is funding top secret projects? If so, what does this black budget pay for? Mark says it would be naive to think there wasn't funding available for operations that have to exist off the books. What that entails, I wouldn't want to venture a guess at publicly. Governor, any thoughts on your end? Well, absolutely. You know, you got this agency, I think it's called DARPA. Mm -hmm. I, I ran into them doing conspiracy theory, and that's the high level secretive end of the Pentagon. They get money, and they don't even have to say what they use it for, which I think is outrageous. Because I've always believed, as a taxpayer in this country, I have every right, every right to know where every dime is that they take of my money and what it's being used for. DARPA is the agency that does all this sneaky, behind-the-scenes type stuff. All right, Josh says he has a few ideas. Mixing DNA of different species, subject to all forms of testing, testing high-tech microchip implants on apes to maximize intelligence, and even testing modes of rapid, undetectable deployment using small glider jets, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brigida, you're getting beyond me. I'm learning this as we're going along right here. If he says that's what's going on, I'll have to take him for his word because <laughs> I can't sit here and tell you that I know about it. <laughs> All right, we're reaching the end of the show, so I want to get your final thoughts on where you think government money goes when it's reported as missing and when it's unaccounted for. Where do I think it goes? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it gets hijacked and goes into pockets like Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I think happens to a lot of the money. Uh, when they can't account for something, they are dealing with the public trust. And they are dealing with our tax dollars. Every nickel or every dime of that money should be accounted for to the taxpayers of America. And they have no right to be doing things with no accountability. Look at the Pentagon right now. They're finally starting to talk about auditing this thing, the Pentagon, this gigantic, massive. Why wasn't this audited years ago? How could they let an organization like this go for 40, 50, 60, 70 years and never have been audited? Yeah, we have the right to know what they spend our money on. That's the bottom line. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Send us your comments on Facebook and Twitter for a chance to be featured in next week's episode. We will be covering the Olympics. And remember, when the government lies, the truth becomes a traitor. Until next week, stay vigilant. The world according to Jesse. Jesse.